Time for Hope has had the privilege of having many gifted and insightful authors appear as our guests through the years. We have decided to rerun from time to time some of our past shows related to subjects that did and will again give our viewers the opportunity to be informed and inspired to accept the challenges they are currently experiencing in their lives. To help couples strengthen their relationships, Dr. Frida has chosen to rerun her interview with Dr. David Hawkins as they discussed his book, Nine Critical Mistakes Most Couples Make. Thank you for joining us on Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. Our guest today is clinical psychologist, author, and conference speaker, Dr. David Hawkins, and we're discussing his book, Nine Critical Mistakes Most Couples Make. Everybody makes mistakes, and the consequences are often small and easy to resolve. But when marriage partners consistently make one or more of the nine critical mistakes, they can get into real trouble. Dr. Hawkins and I want to help you recognize the critical mistakes that you may be making in your marriage so that you can turn your marriage around before it's too late. David, I don't have to tell you again, do I? I don't need to repeat how much I appreciate <laughs> your coming and being on Time for Hope. And the feelings are mutual. I love being here. And, and your books are always great. You do a, a really good job. Thank you. Really quick question about this All one. All right. Why, why nine critical why mistakes? Nine? You, you couldn't find any more? <laughs> I could come up with some fancy answer about why nine, but I, the honest answer is I reflected on, you know, what, what, what are the, the major issues? You know, when you think about, okay, every marriage it's in trouble and you think okay I mean what are the patterns and I just sat down I said okay that's a pattern that's a pattern that's a pattern that's a and it came up to nine so I said, oh, get a ten out of it, 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 it is nine that's all there is Nailed Dr. Frida it. not eleven not eight nine you nailed it at <laughs> nine oh, David right off the bat let me yes. ask you this I'm of the opinion that these patterns you just referred yes. to probably develop within the first year of marriage. Do you think I'm right on that, or do oh, they develop yes. over a process of time? I, I would even go back even further than that. Further than I, that? I, th I think people or come... began to develop, I should I, say. I think people come into marriage with certain patterns of relating. Okay, they've developed these patterns. They may come from an alcoholic family or they may come from a leave it to beaver family, but they've still developed patterns of relating. They then get with their mate and then they develop these critical mistakes. And they like grow you, them, don't they? They, they do, and, then, and you, know, you know how we are with patterns and mistakes. I mean, we, you know, we put on these pair of shoes and we just keep wearing them and then they start forming to our feet. And so these mistakes, we make them again and again and again. And over time, they become disastrous. But also involved in that, David, and we're, we're really getting into some real psychotherapy here. In the meantime, isn't there some sense of security and comfort within all of this ugliness that is oh, developing? Oh, come in these on, patterns? Dr. Frida, who wants to change? I mean, change is just, you know, I mean, don't we just resist change like crazy? I mean, I counsel, and, and you know this, you, you, you're a counselor, you know, we have couples coming into our office and they say, what we're doing is not working. And so we say, well, then how about if we think about changing? Oh no, that, no, not that. Not, not that. <laughs> I just want to feel better. So, so yes, we grab tenaciously onto these patterns. And I, I tell you, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to pry fingers off of a off of a, a stony, hard, brittle rock, and yet they hang on to these mistakes, knowing they know intellectually that it's hurting them. But and to that give them up, like and it's it not is. working, and and so I, I mean I hope that what I've written here, I hope that what we we do together here is we're really going to challenge people to come on. You, you you know yes, it's hard to let go of patterns, but you've got to because they're killing you. At least start looking at absolutely. them and, and help that awareness to develop a absolutely. you know and getting honest with themselves that it's not working like absolutely. it is that's what you're doing here after all why are you here if, it, if it's working what are you doing here that's right and the first uh, thing that you start out with in your book is where I usually like to start and that is mm -hmm. learning from our mistakes uh, yes everybody makes them but yes. if we don't learn from them. You, you know, I, I learned something that's, that's very profound. I talk about this. It's, it's profound to me, and I hope you'll find it equally profound, and, and it's called pattern interruption. 
Mm -hmm. That's it. It's a technique. It's called pattern and eruption. In other words, sometimes I counsel couples to do, so we, so we identify the pattern, and we're going to talk about a couple of them today, but we identify the pattern and then do anything different. I mean, I don't care what you do. Do anything different. We're going to interrupt that pattern. We're going to break that, you know, instead of doing the same thing, what, what do they say? Do the same thing over and over again, expect different results, and that's called insanity. Okay, it's not going to be different if you keep doing it, but pattern interruption, that's what we're all about. Yes, and, and maybe sometimes just bringing that to the partner's attention, you know, uh, yes. is that this is the way it always, yes. uh, this is yes. what it always comes to. Here we are again at the same place, saying yeah, the same yeah, things, yeah. doing the same thing. Just maybe getting that out in the open uh, could start that interruption if, if that you're talking if about. If it's predictable, it's preventable. And if couples can, can develop what I call a third eye, in other words, watching how we are interacting. And, it, and, and this is a skill, Dr. Frida, it really is, for couples to be able to communicate and we identify the pattern and then I say to them, now I want you to watch for that pattern throughout this week and when I meet with you next week, I want you to tell me how many times you noticed yourself falling into that pattern. So with a third eye, they are catching themselves so they're aware of their patterns. If it's predictable, it's preventable, thank God. Now, <laughs> what else would you add to learning uh, from, from our mistakes? Uh, learning from these uh, patterns, these maladaptive yes. patterns, looking at them and learning uh, from them. So you're saying that we make these mistakes, yes. uh, but and it's, it, we need to recognize them and yes. then recognizing them and making and, change. And, and, and interrupting them and mm -hmm. then we identify some new behaviors and we practice some new behaviors and, and essentially, you know, my counseling is very simple. Watch what works and watch what doesn't work. You know, and we're going we're gonna to eradicate what doesn't work and we're going to build upon what does work. So it's profoundly difficult and it's profoundly easy. And it's, it's, it's time, that's a good <laughs> note to go out on. Okay. And we'll be right back. The failure to meet uh, these important emotional needs uh, destroys a romantic relationship. So if you're not meeting each other's important emotional needs, you're not in a romantic relationship and that creates a vacuum. Um, this makes a, a romantic relationship with somebody else very, very tempting. And so the two sort of go together. If you're meeting each other's emotional needs, you'll help protect your marriage from infidelity as well as staying in love with each other. If you don't meet each other's emotional needs, you run a very high risk of somebody coming in and meeting those needs your spouse falling in love with that person and thinking that you shouldn't be married anymore. We hear this every time we do a radio show, um, that someone has fallen out of love. Either it's the husband or the wife and they think that that's the time to end their marriage. This is what I was faced with when I was first doing marriage counseling. And Here goes I, the story I, I was asked a, you for. I was a Christian and I believed in the permanence of marriage and when I married Joyce I, I promised to uh, love and cherish her till death do us part and for somebody to come to me especially Christians one of my first couples that I counseled was the pastor of my church and his wife and um, it came to me and said uh, she said that she was no longer in love with her husband and of course my original reaction was so what <laughs> you know you, you're committed for life this is it you know make the best of it <clears throat> and they got divorced and uh, couple after couple and I would read them scripture and I would tell them that this is not God's will, that God wanted them to stay together. And I became aware of the fact that if I wanted to save these marriages, and they were Christian marriages, um, I had to teach them how to restore their love for each other because without their love, so many people wanted to divorce. And so I set about to do that. And I taught people how to fall in love. Uh, my book, His Needs, Her Needs, is, is one of several I've written that teach people how to stay in love with each other. Now, I believe, I still believe in the permanence of marriage, whether you're in love or not. I believe that when you've married somebody, you're committed for life. And if, the, if you don't happen to love that person, you're still committed. But I've also taught people how to stay in love when they are married to each other, because when they fall out of love, th they think right away of getting a divorce.
It's good to have you join us on Time for Hope. We're talking with Dr. David Hawkins about his book, Nine Critical Mistakes Most Couples Make. But as always, I want to share something from a viewer. Please pray that I would accept and receive a more personal revelation of God's love for me and for a deep emotional soul healing for both myself and my husband. We need a new marriage. We need the Lord very much and a deep renewal of the way we think and perceive ourselves and the Lord. And I mm. will agree with this viewer that she has great insight into the needs of both she and her husband. Mm -hmm. And we have taken those needs to God. We know that he is able to meet each and every one of these needs this viewer has outlined. We do this with each and every prayer request that comes into Time for Hope. I would also direct you to the Time for Hope website. We have many good resources there. I always ask you to go there, look at the resources, and when you choose a resource from our website and call us and order it, it's helping this ministry financially. And of course, we always appreciate any financial help that you are willing to give to this ministry. Now, David, again, this is right mm. down your line and what we're talking about. Yes. And we have these kinds of letters and requests and prayer requests come in uh, regularly at Time for Hope. Mm. But um, so I'm going to kind of hand it over to you. If you can well, remember, I can sure, read yeah. it if I need to. No, no, no. She she speaks from her heart. And, and you know, what's, what's wonderful about this is I mean, a couple of things. She's being vulnerable. She is saying that there's some deep pain going on, some patterns. And she's, she's identified that we, we don't know what the patterns are. She doesn't share in her letter to us what the patterns are, but she's noticed them and they are concerning to her. And she's reaching out to you and the program and she's reaching out to the Lord for some healing. And boy, what, what more can we ask for than that? To identify the patterns and to ask for help I mean, from, the, from the great healer, what, what, what more can we ask? And we, so we do hope that they will identify the patterns, seek God's help, and seek some good counseling. I would add that for that writer. I was going that to add that. Let's don't leave that out. L that. Good, good counseling to, you know, because we've got to identify the pattern. You know, the, 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 as in the medical profession, without making an accurate diagnosis, you can't get the right kind of healing. And it's the same way emotionally. If we don't identify this pattern, and so, I mean, we'll get into one or two or three of, our, of, the, of these mistakes that we make. If you don't make the proper diagnosis, you can't get the healing you need. So I really challenge her to, just, to go beyond. I mean, that's good to get to, to seek divine help and it's good to reach out to the program, but now get into a counselor who can look into your lives and into your marriage and say, I see this pattern going on with you two that is disruptive, dysfunctional, maladaptive, and it will kill you guys. And as she looks to the Lord, she actually can pray for guidance yeah, as yep. to what counselor yep. uh, and that the counselor will yes. be led of the Lord in giving the direction that they're seeking for. That's right. She makes an unusual statement in here. Hmm. We need a new marriage. Yes. When you think of marriage and I think of even spiritual conversion, you know we need it over and over, oh, not yes. just a one time yes. conversion. In marriage it goes through seasons. Yes. And it's it's okay to think about it's time that we need a new marriage. It, it you know, this, yes. the old patterns as you refer to, they need to go. They, they, and they and need we to need a new beginning in this marriage. Someone another cliche that I like, uh, Doctor Frida, is without a breakdown there's rarely a breakthrough. In other words, the wheels have to fall off the cart. We have to, we have to, you know, we got to get a couple of flat tires before we go in and say, help me out with a new, new rig here. So mm -hmm. yeah, we can almost hope in a way that the wheels will continue to fall off the cart for this woman. It, it, yes, they, I mean, the old thing is not working. They need a new relationship. That if it will push her to get help. Absolutely. If it will push her to That's get right. help and make the, the changes that you talked about. Right. Um, now, we look at these nine, these nine. There's nine, <laughs> not 10. Nine critical <laughs> nine. mistakes. And the first one has to do with pushing the plunger. I know that was so cute. Uh, but uh, avoiding emotional explosions. So somebody, as a general rule, uh, when these patterns set in, and especially yes. patterns of communication that yes. you talk about, yes. 
someone explodes before it's over, right? Oh, there, you know, Dr. Frito, you know what we can do? Maybe both. When, when you listen to a couple communicate, you know within the first 30 to 60 seconds if it's going to go sideways on you. Somebody gets emotional about a per particular issue, then the other one gets emotional, and then someone does something to escalate things, and then they are off and running, and then they, you know, they're, they're they might be calling each other names, or they might be saying, oh, what you said is stupid, or, and that's what I call pushing the dynamite plunger. Somebody has said, okay. It's like pushing a button. It's like pushing, it. pushing We're, we're going to go at this thing now. Now it's win, lose, you against me, left against right, good against bad, right against wrong. And, and the, the lines are drawn, and it's a war. And, and couples need to develop the skill to say, time out. out. You know, one of the things that I uh, means a whole lot to me in any situation in relationship conflict is the whole idea that I don't have to win. I don't yeah, have to win this know, war. You know, if you want to win, you win. I don't have to win. What? What a you know a humble spirit. What a, if if I could if I could grant every marriage one thing that probably would be it, a humble spirit. I don't have to win. If I, if I, but most of us, we get, you know, we get locked on to our point of view. And we, it's only one. It's the oh, only man, one. It's you know? my Nobody point right. of view, and you disagree with me, and pretty soon we are battling. And what couples don't realize is that you can, you can have that fight, and you can even win that fight, so to speak. But you will every marriage. I hope people will understand this. Every marriage is a fine fabric. And every time you get into a knockdown drag out, you will be eroding the integrity of that fabric. Every time. Every time. You may not see it. But it, it Dr. Frieda, but that cloth is not as strong as it was before. No. So so know in your heart when you battle this thing out, when you fail to call a timeout, when you fail to manage your emotions, you will be destroying the integrity of that fine, wonderful fabric. You're already making a critical mistake. It's a critical uh, mistake. In, uh, critical. In a One of nine. <laughs> One of nine. <laughs> Stay with us and we'll be right back. Two people in love does not automatically generate the depth of intimacy that most couples desire and expect within a marriage. Open communication, warmth, feelings of closeness and oneness are sacred marital jewels that must be guarded or sought after in a meaningful marriage. The marital relationship can be robbed of intimacy by behaviors as simple as carelessness and neglect, a refusal to listen to each other, inattentiveness and lack of planned time together, and undoubtedly unresolved conflict, accumulated anger, unkind and abusive words, and seething resentment will suffocate the flames of marital intimacy. If you feel that your marriage has lost the intimacy that you once enjoyed with your spouse, or that you must admit it has never provided the depth of warmth, closeness, and oneness that you desire, know that there is hope of change, but just don't expect it to come overnight. The first direction that I give is to try opening up the lines of communication with your spouse and began by asking for a time to talk about your concerns related to your marriage. If there is flagrant unconcern from your spouse, ask God to soften his or her heart so that he or she will become willing to listen and talk. And always be alert to and express your appreciation to your spouse for even the smallest positive response that you receive. If you have harbored anger and resentment towards your spouse, tell them. If you need their forgiveness, then ask for it. If your spouse has habitually been angry and unkind, you will probably need to seek out a professional counselor to help you begin setting appropriate boundaries. Then next, spell out specifically what you need 
from your spouse and encourage him or her to do the same. If the requests are valid, then agree to start making the changes that will say to them they are loved and appreciated. This can encourage your mate to do the same. And don't expect your spouse to provide all of your relationship intimacy needs. Instead, I challenge you to believe that your deepest longings for love and intimacy can be met in a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, then seek to know him. And if you need spiritual direction, call or write us. We always appreciate your joining us on Time for Hope. Today we're talking with Dr. David Hawkins about his book, Nine Critical Mistakes Most Couples Make. Now, David, I would, I, we don't have a lot of time left okay. as usual. It goes so fast, especially when, uh, when you and I are <laughs> yes. uh, interacting. But I have to ask you about this third critical mistake. And okay. I don't know what's so wrong with it because I live down here in Dixie. Uh, 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 what do you, uh, <laughs> what do you Dixie. mean by stop whistling Dixie? Well, you know, okay, I, I had a little fun with that, of course. But whistling Dixie, you know, we, we often make mountains out of molehills. Okay, we're, we're, we're all guilty of that, taking on an issue and making it bigger than it needs to be. But whistling Dixie is the opposite of that. It's when we're making a molehill out of a mountain, okay? Maybe there's an addiction going on in the relationship. Maybe there's an untamed tongue going on. That Maybe there's an, a rageaholic. Maybe there's any number of issues, and we just kind of go on along, and we, we, we essentially tell ourselves, uh, you know, it's not too bad. It's not I too, mean, we, everybody we, does. We'll, it, we'll be we're fine. We're no different than anybody else. You know, the else relationship's not that bad. Mm. It's gonna, we're gonna be fine. And all the while, again, this problem. It's called, you know, it's called the stinky elephant in the room. You've, you've, you've heard that line. This elephant is parading through the room, and anybody who would come and look at our relationship would notice and go, "Whoa, there's a huge elephant." But because we are using that thing called denial. We don't, we can tell ourselves it's not really happening. We can, we can skirt around it, but we can't skirt around whistling it. Whistling away as if. We're whistling away <laughs> as if. Fine. And, and so I would really ask couples to, to take a critical inventory. You know, there's a thing in, in uh, the 12 step program that's called taking a fearless moral inventory. What would happen if we did that in our marriages? If we said, you know, once a year we're going to take a fearless moral inventory, we're going to take a look at all of the issues in our marriage, or we're going to go, better yet, we're going to go to a counselor. That and help. A third party. We're going to go to a counselor or a pastor, and once a year we're going to have somebody look into our lives and say, what do you see? And so it takes courage to do that, though, Dr. Frieda. I mean, imagine. It takes courage to stop whistling Dixie. It takes courage. Another thing that goes along <laughs> with that is stop sweeping it under the rug. We, we say that down in Dixie. Did they say that where you come from? We say it up, from? too. Stop sweeping <laughs> it under the rug. Let's move on. You've got nine, and of okay. course, um, you, and they're all very good. But I want to go on down to... Uh, about the paper fences that has to do with boundaries. Yes, you know, boundaries, th there's another thing that's so critical, Dr. Frieda, is having healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries, of course, are like fences, okay? Fences... They divide you and me. They divide you and me. Your stuff is your stuff, my stuff is my stuff. And so when I have a healthy boundary, I'm, I'm looking at me. And, and, and God and me are doing some work on me, and I'm taking care of me, and I'm, I'm less concerned about you. Now, am I concerned about you? Yes, of course. You know, you're my mate. I'm concerned about what's happening in your life. But, but I'm careful to note that your issues are your issues, and my issues are mine. And I, want, I will help you with your issues, or work with you, yeah, cooperate with yeah. you in trying to work out your issues, but I won't own them. I won't, I won't own them. I won't swim for you. I use uh, that, that a lot. That's excellent. Uh, I won't swim for, I'll swim along with, beside you, but yeah. I won't swim for now, you. And, and, and one more thing about that, Dr. Frieda, not only will I not do your work, but a good healthy fence is going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to confront you a bit if you try to do something for me that I ought to be doing for myself. So if you tell me what I'm thinking, if you tell me what I'm feeling, if you tell me how I should be acting, if you tell me stuff that's my stuff, I'm going to lovingly say, Don't you know, play God. You know, you got, that's another there's one another one. Have. But in boundaries, it, it's so refreshing. Now, this is, but this is touchy stuff to do this with your mate. But it's so healing if you can say to your mate, please don't tell me what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. 
Those are my personal, that's, that's personal to me. You can tell me what you think about what I'm doing. You can give me an opinion, but don't tell me what I'm thinking or feeling. So those are, so not only do we not do someone else's work, we also set healthy boundaries so that they don't tell us things about us that are personal to us. Well, I call that an uh, interpreting. Oh, that's uh, good. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an interpretation. Um, you know, <coughs> what I give back to you is my interpretation of what you said or what you did. And that never works, uh, as you know, in a marriage. But yes. uh, going to boundaries, another thing that is so terribly important is being able to say what I want, what oh, I would like, yes, what yes. I will not accept, yes, yes. where I will not go, uh, what I will not do. Even L for, for listen, your mate. That, that is so wonderful how you just even said that, Dr. Frieda. That's so, you are a real person when you can interact that way. Here's what I think, here's what I feel, here's what I want. Now, I really prefer not to do this. Now, I don't know about you, but I really get a little annoyed with people who won't tell me what they prefer, what they want, what they think. I want to interact with somebody who is strong enough to say, you know, I, I don't like that, or you know, that 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 style of worship doesn't really work for me or fit for me, or you know, that that uh, you know that book, I don't I don't care for that book, or I don't care for that TV program, or. I like it when someone has an opinion, a thought, a feeling, and I, I really feel like I can connect with that kind of person. They're, they're, and they're entitled to their thoughts and feelings. And, it's their thoughts and feelings. And those are boundaries. Yes, and then you end your book with, with hope, and that's what this, this show is all about. Yes. Finding the strength and the ability to change. And with these nine critical mistake, mistakes, and by the way, we never mentioned the subtitle of the book, Identify, Identify yes, the identify. Pitfalls and Discover God's help. They must be identified. You br you brought that out. Yes. But God will give us strength uh, and He and will wisdom. enable us and give us wisdom to change. That's our hope, isn't and, it, David? It, well, and it is. And we better recognize and be honest that we, you know, we can't change in and of ourselves. We, we can't do it. It's self will run riot. So we must look to God, and God will give us the strength and the courage. And the wisdom. And we got to go, and what a beautiful word to go out on. Thank you again, David. And it's been wonderful having you on Time for Hope again. And we ask that you join us again next week. A free fact sheet that contains additional information about today's topic is available upon request from our ministry. You can also receive a copy of today's resource for $9 plus $3 shipping and handling. To receive the free fact sheet or our guest's book or both, you may call us at 1-800-669-9133. Write us at Post Office Box 2169, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304. Or visit our website at timeforhope.org. When you call or write, please prayerfully consider a donation to our ministry. Our ministry's mission is to offer hope to discouraged and hurting people. As we continue to give out messages of hope, you can become a member of our team by sending us a financial gift of any amount. When you send your gift to support Time for Hope, you are joining us in offering hope to many viewers who might believe there is no hope for their situation. And you're also enabling us to inform and inspire some viewers to expand our mission as they learn and in turn can minister more effectively to hurting people around them. Until next time, have a great week, and remember, it is time for hope.